you from our Lord and our Savior, Jesus the Christ. I want to invite you to uh, uh, pull out the Bibles that are in your uh, pews there, uh, the black and gray Bibles, and, and we're going to take a look today at uh, John's Gospel, the fourth chapter. At the top of your outline, I've, I've given you the page number, it's page 1583 that we're going to be looking at, page 1583. So I invite you to pull that out, and uh, that'll help you to follow along and to see uh, where we're going with things here this morning, and uh, to uh, follow along on your, on your outline as well, too. And because uh, as I said earlier, we're, talk, talk, we're talking about worship this morning. And um, I thought it was so appropriate that the gospel lesson uh, that I read from uh, Mark was the gospel for today. It, it just affirmed to me that God wants us to be talking about worship today and so forth. And, uh, but also this portion in John's gospel, the fourth chapter, is important. I think as you'll see, it gives us some insights into what worship is all about and so forth. But before we do, let's, let's uh, uh, pray this prayer together. If you'll look up to the screens, there'll be a prayer. And uh, let's pray that to get together. Come Holy Spirit, fill the hearts of your faithful and kindle in us the fire of your love. Send forth your spirit and we shall be created and you shall renew the face of the earth. O God, who by the light of the Holy Spirit instructs the hearts of the faithful, grant that by the same Holy Spirit we may be truly wise and ever rejoice in his consolations. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Well, uh, this morning, as I said, we're going to talk about worship and so forth. And, and uh, if you look with me at this, at this gospel in, in uh, John chapter 4, it's, it's entitled, Jesus Talks with a Samaritan Woman. Okay? This is a Samaritan woman that's at the well of Jacob, okay, that he meets her there. And look at the way it in, it's introduced at the beginning of the chapter. It says, Now Jesus learned that the Pharisees had heard that he was gaining and baptizing more disciples than John. Although, in fact, it was not Jesus who baptized, but his disciples. So he left Judea and went back once more to Galilee. So he wanted to get away from the Pharisees and so forth, okay? So there wouldn't be as many of them up in Galilee. That's why he was leaving Judea, okay? And it says, now, in verse 4, now he had to go through Samaria. In other words, in order to, to get from Judea up to Galilee, he had to go through this area called Samaria. Now, what is Samaria? Samaria was a region that had people that were considered by the Jews to be outcasts. Uh, you've heard of the Good Samaritan, okay? What made the Good Samaritan so interesting was that the Samaritans were, were people who were half-breeds. They were half Canaanites and half uh, Israelites, okay? Ha half Hebrews, all right? Now, they worshipped, they didn't worship at Jerusalem like Jews did. They worshipped in another place because they had a different take on, on what the, the, the Word said, what the Scripture said. But they were looked down upon by the Jews, okay? And so that's the important thing right now to remember, okay? And so, so he had to go through Samaria. He could have gone around. There were ways that Jews could go around to go from one to the other. But Jesus chose not to do that this particular time, okay? So he gets into this conversation at this well of Jacob with this Samaritan woman. Now, number one... Look, what, look at the way that she addresses him in, in verse 9 of this. It says, the Samaritan woman said to him, You are a Jew, and I am a Samaritan woman. How can you ask me for a drink? Because they didn't have any dealings with each other. It's a fact of the matter. Okay? So she finds that to be unusual. And here's a rabbi. Okay? Now his disciples, just so you understand, disciples weren't with him. They had gone into the town okay, to, to get some food and so forth. All right? hanging out there at the, at the well. It wasn't uncommon for people to just hang out there because it was a place where people would come and go and so forth. It's interesting. I know when I've been in Haiti that, that there are various wells where people can get water because, uh, Rob, you know, you've been there with me, that, that, that the wells are a central place where people come and they're talking while they're waiting for somebody to fill up their bucket and so forth. And the same was true with this situation, see? So it wasn't uncommon for people to be hanging out there. So Jesus just said, hey, you guys go, do, go get the groceries. I'll wait right here, basically is what he's saying, okay? So, so she says, you know, hey, you're a Jew, 
And you're talking to me, a Samaritan woman. Now, number one, in that part of the world, men don't talk to women that they don't know. Okay? That, that, that's still a part of the custom in, in, in parts of that world, okay, today. So, so men don't talk to And people of one religion don't talk to people of another religion, typically. Okay? They, I mean, they're, they're, they're segregated in their ways that they deal with each other, okay? So, so this is really, really unusual, okay? And so then, uh, we, let's jump down to verse 16, okay? It's on the other page, it's on 1583 there. And, and so he gets into this conversation about living water, and she's misunderstanding him about that. He's talking about the Spirit of God, basically, and she's talking about, hey, I want water, sort of like a super water, that if I drink it, I won't be thirsty anymore. She's thinking about her thirst, okay? He's talking about something else. So then he says to her, in verse 16, he told her, go call your husband and come back. And her reply in verse 17 is, I have no husband. Jesus said to her, you are right when you say that you have no husband. The fact is that you've had five husbands. And the man you now have is not your husband. What you said is quite true, okay? So, what's, uh, and then, and then he, he said, Sir, the woman said, I can see that you're a prophet. You see, he sees into her who she really is. So, one of the things that, as we're, gonna, as we're talking about worship here, one of the things that happens in worship is that worship reveals us. Now, if you were to come to one of the liturgical services, either at 8 o'clock or 11 o'clock, every week that service starts with, after the opening hymn, what's the first thing that happens there? Confession happens. There's a public confession, okay? A public confession. We, we all say a confession together to God. This morning, as we, as we prayed at the beginning, one of the things that I prayed about was, Lord, hey, we, we don't have our act together. We don't have it all together. We don't have all the answers. You see, one of the first things that worship does is it convicts us that we don't have our act together. That we've come up short. We've come to worship God because He's the one who's holy. We aren't. You see, worship reveals who we are. First and foremost, that God is the one that's holy. We're not. We've come seeking something in our lives that we don't have already in our lives. And God wants us to seek after Him. And so there's this differentiation between God and us right from the very beginning. And, we, and what we're doing is we're being honest with ourselves and with God. That's the first thing that happens when we worship God. Is that we recognize that we aren't God and that He is. And that's so important. Reminded of the story it took place 150 years ago. Uh, it was on a Sunday morning in 1865. And a black man entered a fashionable uh, church in Richmond, Virginia, in downtown Richmond. And when communion was served at that church that morning, he walked down the aisle and knelt at the altar. And you could just feel the resentment in the congregation. This all-white congregation. How dare he was their thinking. After all, the, the, they used common cup in that congregation where they all drank out of the same cup. And the world at that time, in the United States especially, they were fighting a battle over slavery and segregation and those kinds of things. Suddenly a distinguished layman who was sitting out in the congregation stood up stepped toward the altar and knelt next to him. Setting the example, Robert E. Lee, the general of the Confederate Army, knelt next to him. And set an example for the congregation. And the congregation soon followed his lead. When, when we're worshiping God, are we being honest with him? You see, this is, this is uh, a place in, in the Gospels 
where Jesus is recognizing someone who is different than he is and embraces them. You see, he doesn't care where she's been or where she hasn't been. He doesn't care about what she's done or hasn't done. He's saying that, hey, I care about you. And when she's honest with him, a relationship builds. And worship is this opportunity to begin our week with this relationship in an honest and truthful way. He's inviting us to do exactly that when we come to worship. To reveal ourselves to Him. You know, so many times we get out, we, 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 drive, we drive to church, and I can remember when I was a kid going to church, or, or I, I didn't get a chance, honestly, to, I never really had a chance to go to church with my, with my kids, because I always had to go early, and so forth, you know, as a pastor, and so forth. But I can only imagine trying to get in a car with two or three kids and get it all together and, and uh, when, when you pull up and pull into that parking spot you say okay put on that smile right you know after grumbling and all this kind of stuff right but you know what what God is saying to us here is that we don't have to always have that smile on our face because the things we're dealing with hopefully when you leave you have a bigger smile on your face than when you walked in that's the idea. Because you see, God is accepting of this woman. And if he can accept this woman, he can accept us. You see, all the social critics would have been on his back big time if they had known what he did in Samaria. But he's saying to us, hey, are we, are we going to accept one another and know that we are accepted by God? accepted by God you see and uh, uh, but it also reveals something about God doesn't it huh let's let's look at verses 25 and 26 it's toward the end of this uh, of this portion we're looking at today it's down at the bottom of page uh, 1583 verse 25 it says the woman said I know that Messiah called Christ is coming and when he comes he will explain everything to us and then Jesus declared I the one speaking to you I am he. Do you know that in all of the Gospels, in the four Gospels that share Jesus' ministry and life and so forth, this is the only place that Jesus declares that he is the Messiah. The only place. And just think about it. Where does he do it? He does it in a place called Samaria. Not even where the Jews are. He does it with a Samaritan woman, no less. Now let me share with you, gang, that in that day, women were considered property. That's the, way that, that's the way that the culture was. Women were considered property, okay? And I, I, I didn't make that rule up. It was just a rule that they had, okay? So, so uh, uh, you know, here he is speaking, number one, to a Samaritan, Someone who's very different that he really, that Jews, socially you didn't do that. Number two, he's speaking to a woman, okay? And men didn't speak to women in those days, okay? Unless they were their wives, all right? And thirdly, she's a woman who doesn't have one husband, but who's had five husbands. And who uh, now is with somebody else. So she's hardly the picture of purity, huh? You know? And, and so here he is being involved with it. What does that tell us about God? It tells us, you know what? That whatever we've done in the past or haven't done, wherever we've been or haven't been, it's not a disqualifier. If God can have a relationship with this woman, he can have a relationship with anybody, huh? And that's, that is what God is trying to get through to us here. That's what Jesus is trying to get through to us. That there is no, that there is no obstacle too big that anybody can have a relationship with him. 
everybody can have a relationship with him. It includes me, it includes you, it includes our family members, it includes our friends, it includes our co-workers, it includes our enemies as well too. You see, and Jesus is making a point here of, of letting us know that, that there's no barrier to having a relationship with him. And he wants us to know that. He wants us to know that. There's no obstacle too big. You know, sometimes we think that our past has been that which disqualifies us. And, and uh, uh, you know, sometimes people say, oh, I don't want to join a church because it's just full of hypocrites. And if I hear that from somebody, I say, well, what's one more? Come on and join us, you know. <laughs> we all, we're all hypocrites, aren't we? Aren't we all? Aren't we all? You know, what's one more, you know? Uh, because we all are. That's the reality. And I'm reminded of the story of Bruce Larson, one of my favorite authors. And Bruce Larson was a pastor. He was also a counselor. And he uh, had a counseling practice in, in New York City, in downtown uh, in Manhattan. And uh, when he started hearing from somebody who was having various challenges and obstacles in their lives, uh, roadblocks in their lives, and who was taking on all kinds of weight in their lives and was really burdened down by the, by the challenges that they, that they faced. He, said, he would say to them at times, hey, let's go for a walk. Let's go for a walk. Let's get out of the office here for a minute. Let's go for a walk. And he would walk, because his office wasn't too far from Rockefeller Center. He said, he'd say, let's walk over to Rockefeller Center. I want to show you a statue over there. And it was a statue, if you've ever been to Rockefeller Center, you know it's a statue of Atlas bearing, the, bearing the, the weight of the world. Have you seen that? Rockefeller Center there? Yeah. And, and it, you know, he's stressing with every muscle in his, in his body to hold that world up. And uh, a grimace is on his face, like, wow, this is, this is hard. But he's, he's trying to be strong enough to be able to do that. And Larson would say to his patient, to his client, he would say, you know, that's one way to face the challenges of life. It's like Atlas trying to bear all of that weight yourself. He said, but I'd like to show you another statue, he'd say to him. And he'd say, let's walk across the street. You know what is across the street? St. Patrick's Cathedral is across the street. And they would walk there, and behind the altar in St. Patrick's Cathedral, is this statue. It's a statue of Jesus. And in this statue, Jesus is a little boy. And Jesus is holding in one hand the world in his hand. And he, and he turns to his patient or his client and he says, you know what, this is a, an option for you. You can place in Jesus' hand all the cares and the worries and the problems that you have. And you can see on his face that he's not grimacing, but actually as a little boy he's holding that with no problem at all. He would turn to his client or his patient and he'd say, you know, it's your choice. You can have it either way. You can be like Atlas across the street, bearing the weight of all of it yourself, or you can put it in the hands of Jesus who, as you can see, is more than capable of holding it. Your choice, you see. When in worship, Jesus reveals himself to us. He reveals the person who is able to handle the problems of life that we have. But so many times, I do it, you do it, we all do it. We take it all upon ourselves, don't we, huh? Instead of putting it in place in God's hands. And that he works with us in that. That's what he's inviting us to do. And so Jesus reveals himself in worship as well too. And finally, Jesus reveals what real worship is all about. We're going to look at verses 20 through 24 here. And after the woman says that you're a prophet, she says, our ancestors worshipped on this mountain, but you Jews claim that the place where we must worship is in Jerusalem. The woman replied, uh, believe me, woman, excuse, woman Jesus replied, believe me, a time is coming when you will worship in the Father neither 
on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. You Samaritans worship what you do not know, and we worship what we do know, for salvation is from the Jews. Yet a time is coming and has now come when the true worshipers will worship the Father in the spirit and in truth. For they are the kind of worshipers the Father seeks. God is spirit, and his worshipers must worship in the spirit and in truth. What he's saying is, hey, real worship is in the truth of, of who we are, of who we are, and who God is. The real worship is in God's spirit, connecting with God's spirit. And his spirit, as we've already seen, is one that reaches out to a Samaritan, a woman, an immoral person, a person who is far from perfect. And that's the truth about who God is. And the truth is that we aren't perfect. And that we need his love, his forgiveness, his grace. Let me finish up my time with this story. There was a woman, man and woman, who were married, and honestly, they weren't happily married. They really struggled. They weren't even sure they really liked each other, but they had married and, and uh, uh, re decided to remain so until one of them passed away. The man was very demanding, very demanding, so much so that he prepared a list of rules and, and regulations for his wife to follow. I mean, he was a real chauvinist, okay? He insisted that she read them every day, that she memorize them, that she follow the details. There were do's and don'ts that he listed. He listed details like what time she had to get up in the morning, what time his breakfast needed to be ready to go, the housework that should be done each day, and all these kinds of things. And after several long years of their marriage, he was so, so adamant about all these things. One day, he died of a heart attack. As time passed, the woman fell in love with another man. One who dearly loved her for who she was. And he couldn't make her life happy enough. He'd bring her tokens of appreciation, flowers and those kinds of things. And they married. And his life was in so many ways about making his wife happy. One day, as she was going through the house cleaning up, she opened up a drawer to, to put some things away, and she found a piece of paper in her drawer. And it was the list that her first husband had created for her. All the do's and don'ts, all the things to get done on which day, and all these kinds of things, the demands that he had. And as she looked over that list that she hadn't looked at in a number of years, she realized that the things that were on that list were the things that she was doing every day. Not because she had to, because she wanted to. She wanted to. Not because it was an obligation demanded of her, but because it was a response of the love that her husband showed her. You see, worship is the same way. God doesn't care whether we worship with an organ or a band. He doesn't care whether we worship in a sanctuary or in a field. He doesn't worry about all those kinds of things. Because you see, the worship isn't in all these things. The worship's in our heart. That's where it is. Do we come to worship with a grateful heart? Knowing that God has blessed us. He's given us the health to be here. He's given us the work that we need to have, give life and our uh, purpose to our lives and so forth. Do we, do we worship him for the family and the friends that we have? Thanking and praising him for that. That's what worship's all about. For our heart to beat like his. To care about the things that God cares about. That's what worship's all about, you see. And that's what Jesus was trying to tell this woman and to tell us. And that we should worship not out of obligation,
but out of a response to his love and grace in our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.